Namaskar. Welcome to the special edition of the Embassy Weekly Online. As you are aware, on February 24th, Russian President Vladimir Putin, pursuant to the Treaties of Friendship, Cooperation and Mutual Assistance, signed with the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics after acknowledging them as uh, independent states on February 21st, made a decision to launch a special military operation to protect people of uh, Donbass who for the last eight years have been suffering humiliation and genocide at the hands of the Kyiv regime. We simply don't have any other choice to protect our people and will have to use the only available choice that we will use today. The circumstances require immediate, resolute action. People's Republics of the Donbass have requested assistance from Russia. In this regard, in line with Article 51.7 of the UN Charter, with the authorization of the Parliament of Russia and in exercising the Treaty on Friendship and Mutual Assistance with the Donetsk People's Republics and the Lugansk People's Republics, I have taken the decision to conduct a special military operation. Its purpose is to protect people who have been subject to abuse and genocide by the Kyiv regime for eight years. And to do this, we will strive to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Unfortunately, we see that few remember events of 2014 when the anti-constitutional coup happened in Ukraine. Not to mention that almost no one aware of the present situation in Donbass. Meanwhile, people of this region until today live in a nightmare. In this regard, we would like to briefly elaborate on the situation around inter-Ukrainian crisis, specifying key moments uh, crucial for understanding the whole picture. All started with mass demonstrations in Kyiv, which later became known as Euromaidan or simply Maidan protests which began in late 2013 after the then President Viktor Yanukovych decided to delay the signing of the European uh, Union Association deal. The initially peaceful protests were joined by the hardline nationalists who uh, later will be sent by the government to kill Donbass people in the framework of the so-called Unity Federation. In a result, violent riots and takeovers of administrative buildings started across Ukraine. In February 2014, pro-Western factions overthrew President Yanukovych and his government and Ukrainians with a notable pro-European and anti-Moscow stance illegally came to power. While the Maidan events received widespread support in the western parts of Ukraine, the eastern and southern regions, which have a large Russian-speaking population, around 4 million people, and strong historic ties with Russia, came out strongly against the events in Kyiv. Clashes between neo-Nazis and anti-Maidan protesters took place across the whole country. But what happened in Odessa on uh, 2nd May 2014 would be remembered as one of the darkest pages in Ukraine's history. Following street fighting with neo-Nazis, the anti-Maidan protesters barricaded themselves in a local trade union's house. Their opponents, uh, backed by the new uh, Ukrainian authorities, encircled the building and set it on fire. When the blaze erupted on the second and third floors of the building, several hundred people trapped inside desperately tried to escape. Ten of them fell to their death. Thirty-two more died suffering from severe burns and suffocating from smoke. 250 others managed to escape the death trap with various injuries as fight fighters arrived only one hour later. Interesting. Not a word of condemnation we have heard from the Western countries who actively supported the coup d'etat in Kyiv. Their ignorance of crimes have encouraged new Ukrainian authorities and nationalist groups, which from that moment had no boundaries, neither moral nor legal. In cities such as Odessa, the anti-Maidan protests soon were violently suppressed. In the eastern regions and the Black Sea Autonomous Republic of Crimea, Pro-Russian protests persisted. The Republic of Crimea and the special status city of Sevastopol, which had continuously hosted a Russian naval base, responded to the Kyiv coup by holding a snap referendum in March 2014, during which Crimeans overwhelmingly voted to rejoin Russia. 
In April 2014, seeking for shelter from the Kyiv regime, which was imposing its nationalist agenda, depriving Russian-speaking population of their basic human rights, Donetsk and Lugansk conducted a referendum during which people voted to declare independence. The Ukrainian government responded to that by launching what it called an anti-terrorist operation. In fact, it was a punitive military action. Newly formed battalions of the neo-Nazi militants had joined the army military troops that was sent to Donbass. It was hard to imagine that in the modern Europe you can still see armed national troops affiliated with the government and national army. Heavy shelling in the cities of Donetsk and Lugansk caused civilian casualties and heavy losses. For instance, in the summer of fall 2014, because of massive indiscriminate artillery strikes by the Ukrainian army, throughout the territory of the Lugansk People's Republic, 2,000 civilians were killed, including 35 children. Shooting was made using means of warfare, like multiple launch rocket systems, large caliber motors, prohibited by international humanitarian law. In addition to hourly shelling of peaceful settlements, the Ukrainian regime deliberately turned off water supply, electricity, mobile communications, blocked the access to food and medicine supplies. In a most cynical manner, attacks were committed on hospitals, morgues and schools where bomb shelters were organized. Even cemeteries were also shelled. For this reason, civilians were forced to form spontaneous mass graves for the victims of the aggression. To this day, burials of civilians who lived and worked on their land are found in the fields, household backyards, in the courtyards of residential buildings. According to the United Nations, over 13,000 have been killed in the region since the Maidan coup d'etat in February 2014. Thousands more were injured and over two and a half million of the region's residents fled their homes with over a million seeking refuge in Russia. For years, Moscow has been calling on Western nations to investigate cases of the human rights abuse, illegal killings and war crimes committed by the Ukrainian authorities and neo-Nazis against Russians and Russian-speaking people. However, the West chose to ignore that appeals, and thus the horrific deeds remained unpunished. All of such crimes gathered in an 80-page long white book assembled by the Russian Foreign Ministry. The link will be in the description. Russia has been doing its utmost for eight years to urge the Kyiv authorities to stop the punitive operation against its own people, to settle the conflict in Donbass by peaceful, political and diplomatic means, to establish a direct dialogue with Donetsk and Lugansk as per paragraph 4 of the package of measures. Unfortunately, Kyiv, with the support from the West, evaded its commitments under the Minsk agreements in every possible way trying to shift responsibility for its own actions onto Russia. Together with that, the United States and NATO ignored Russia's draft security treaties proposed by Moscow in December 2021 in an effort to defuse the current crisis. The chance to have negotiations was possible until the very end a month ago. I reported to Mr. Putin what was the reaction uh, from our counterparts in North Atlantic Treaty Organization, first of all, in the U.S., to our proposal to agree on fair security guarantees. And such guarantees would be fair and just based on the decisions made by in OSC at the highest level, in a fair way, not in uh, some sly way as it was interpreted by the collective West when they said that any country can choose whatever military alliances they want, but there was a restriction not to enhance one's security at the expense of the security of the others. They ignored it. At the very same time, the same time, they were pumping Ukraine with weapons. Starting from the beginning of this year to the end of the second decade of February, nearly 50 military transport aircrafts from various countries, USA, Great Britain, Canada, Poland and Lithuania, landed in Ukraine. In total, Kyiv received 2,000 tons of advanced weapons, ammunition and protective equipment. By December 2021, the Kyiv government had amassed up to 125,000 troops along the contact line with the Donbas republics. Over the past several weeks, the Ukrainian military had intensified bombardment of the Donbas region, prompting the leadership of the Donetsk and Lugansk to launch an evacuation of children and elderly people to Russia. After some time, they had to pause evacuation, as the Ukrainian military have been targeting evacuees with mines and shells. Such developments have left the Russian leadership without any other choice 
but to initiate the special military operation to save people. All this here is our Western counterparts. We're trying to cover for the Ukrainian regime, turning away from the war crimes against civilian population, closing their eyes on killing women, the elderly, the children, destruction of the civil civilian infrastructure and encouraging the growth of Russophobic neo-Nazi sentiments that brought the country to the edge. And the West now sided with the Kyiv regime and with its effort to sabotage and to undermine the Minsk agreements, NATO and the European Union covered for Kyiv in the recent weeks as well, when it intended to use force to capture the Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic. They said there is no alternative to joining NATO and started threatening with acquiring nuclear weapons. In this situation, the Russian Federation couldn't stand idly. It is necessary to underline that the Russian armed forces and troops of Donetsk and Lugansk take all measures to save the lives of civilians. Our troops that participate in the special operation have a strict order to use high precision weapons to render inoperable the military infrastructure, facilities and in the dorms of the Ukrainian soldiers. They, they are no, no target to strikes. During the operation only military infrastructure, air defense facilities, military airfields and the air force are being taken care of. Meanwhile, the Kyiv regime massively and uncontrollably distributes automatic small arms, grenade launchers and ammunition to residents of the Ukrainian settlements. There are also reports that uh, the Ukrainian nationalists uh, deploy rocket and artillery units in residential areas, not only in Kyiv, but also in other Ukrainian cities, using civilians as a shield. Not to mention severe provocations. Uh, for instance, on February 26th, Ukrainian nationalists from the Azov Battalion attacked residential areas of Sartana settlement in Mariupol suburbs and school number 8 in Mariupol city with the Grad multiple rocket launch systems. As a result, residential buildings are destructed and there are casualties among the civilians. And the fact that we are fighting against new Nazis is proved by how the hostilities are going. Nationalists and neo Nazi units that are using foreign mercenaries from the Middle East also, they use civilians as human shields, hiding behind their backs. And we have facts, we have pictures of how they deploy heavy weapons in the residential areas of their cities. And that's how gangsters act. Areas from the kindergartens, from hospitals, they do the opposite, they put their mortar guns, they put their tanks, they put their cannons, and they are taking foreign citizens hostage, thousands of young people, students who were studying in Ukraine colleges. So for more than one day, they kept three, more than 3,000 Indian citizens at the train station in Kharkiv. The situation around the Indian students in Ukraine was discussed during telephone conversation between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi on 2nd of March. Russian President stressed that all the necessary instructions had been given and that the Russian military was doing everything possible to ensure the safe removal of the Indian citizens from the war zone and their safe return to their homeland. We'd like to use this opportunity and once again express our deepest condolences with regards to the tragic death of the Indian student in one of the Ukraine cities, Kharkov. Let me join the words of condolences which were expressed by the Indian leadership and uh, by the Russian uh, uh, officials, including my ambassador, the day itself, uh, early in, during the day, with regard to the um, uh, death um, of the Indian student in the city of Kharkiv. Uh, the incident should be uh, thoroughly investigated, and uh, we, we are in touch with our uh, Indian partners in the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, we had um, the, um, the on conversation in regard to the Ukraine, Ukrainian crisis and this incident, and how we can um, how can we uh, cooperate with each other uh, to, with regard to the uh, uh, opening uh, uh, safe humanitarian corridors. 
With regard to the media coverage of the situation in Ukraine, we urge you to question more. There are tons of fake uh, reports uh, fabricated by the Kyiv regime. They use all footage from 2014 and pass it off as events of today. They show you aftermath of the Ukrainian army and neo-Nazi battalions crimes and deeds, passing them off as being conducted by forces of Russia, Donetsk and Lugansk. But one thing that isn't helping at all is the unbelievable amount of fake images and videos being spread, not only on social media, but also by legitimate news outlets. Build, a political news outlet in Germany, shared a video of what looked to be a horrific bombing by the Russians in Kiev during one of their broadcasts. But it turns out the footage was from a 2015 chemical explosion in Tianjin, China. Newsmax used a photo of a crying older woman standing in front of her devastated home with the caption, the current devastation in Ukraine. But the photo was from 2015. An Italian news broadcast used footage from the video game War Thunder when talking about the war in Ukraine. No doubt viewers seeing a rain of missiles were horrified. It was being reported that 13 heroic soldiers on Snake Island were confronted by a, wa a Russian warship. The audio recording shows the Russians telling the Ukrainians to lay down their arms to avoid bloodshed and unjustified deaths. It was then reported they fought valiantly until they were all killed by the Russians. President Zelensky even announced he would posthumously award the men medals of valor. Well, it turns out whomever claimed they had died was mistaken. Instead, the Ukrainian border guard disputed whether anyone was killed. And shortly after, video footage emerged of the Russians giving food and water to the 82 men, not 13, from Snake Island, who were then being transferred to Crimea. Western and Ukrainian media are creating thousands of fake news on Russia every day. Here's a brave Ukrainian girl standing up to a Russian soldier. Yeah, but if you actually hit play, you could tell that this is an Israeli soldier and a Palestinian girl. Gets the job done, though. Sometimes the propaganda machine uses very placed shots. Well, no wonder. They were taken from a 1996 Serbian movie Pretty Village, Pretty Flame. Here we can spot some Russian planes on their way to bomb Kiev. Probably straight from the May 9th victory parade in Moscow they were used at. Now this picture states that the Russians are using multiple launch rocket systems. And they were indeed used in military drills a year ago. Here's the Ukrainian ambassador to the UN, Sergei Kislitsa. And here's the last minute text of a dead Russian soldier. The only thing is that Russian soldiers are not allowed to use cell phones in combat missions, especially iPhones. By the way, you can easily check uh, the real situation in the Ukrainian cities only by watching numerous available webcams in YouTube, like this one. So, don't be misguided. The Russian Defense Ministry reports on the daily basis about the developments on the ground. And you can find the relevant information on our social media and website.